All right. Welcome to, uh, wow, day five of Summer Fish Traps. Uh, what do I call them? Faculty readings. Can you tell it's day five? Um, this is the last day of our uh, uh, faculty faculty reading series. Um, and it has been quite the week, um, a lot of really powerful things. And this, I can think of no one better to close us out than our own Sharma Shields, um, who's been, I think, um, the cheerleader throughout the week. I think a lot of you have noticed that throughout the week that she's been, um, you know, showing up and making comments and cheering everybody on. And um, and I can tell that because I, I see several faculty that have joined us for their reading this afternoon live. So uh, this is, um, like I say, the the the, <laughs> the end of the day. I got I got the opportunity today to uh, spend some time with the kids at um, Joseph Charter School for their showcase, and they had chosen not to record that. They had asked that we didn't show it, and I totally respect it. And after reading, seeing some of their readings that got pretty personal, I certainly understand why. But I have to say, I am disappointed for all of you because they were rock stars, and I hope. Uh, well, I know that you'll get to hear from them in the future. Um, they are something to behold and they did you proud. So, um, and if any of them are tuning in um, either now or later, I just want to again say how proud I am of them and how proud I am of, um, you know, what a wonderful job um, Whitney and James, uh, James, Jason did this week of bringing them together. So um, thanks for that. So um, for our reading this, 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 to wrap things up today, we're gonna do kind of what we've done in the past. For those of you that have um, tuned in via Zoom, our fish trappers, if you want to type in questions or comments during the chat, you are more than welcome to do that. And we'll leave some time at the end for questions. Um, and with that, I'm going to uh, introduce you to the wonderful Sharma Shields. She's in the author of the short story collection, The Favorite Monster and two novels, The Sasquatch Hunters, Almanac and the Cassandra, which I read this past year and was wonderful and highly recommend it. Her short stories and essays have appeared in the New York Times, Electric Lit, Catapult, Slice, Slate, Fairy Tale Review, Canyon Review, Io Review, Fugue, and everywhere else that should have her, hasn't had her yet, is going to have her soon. Um, She's a current employee of Wishing Tree Books in Spokane. She's worked in independent bookstores and public libraries throughout Washington state, which means that she's a unicorn. We live with her husband. Uh, well, we live, she lives with her husband and writer and graphic novelist, Simeon Mills and their two children. And I wanna talk a little bit about her connection with, um, with us. Uh, she came to Summer Fish Trap a couple of years ago. We, uh, a few years ago, we heard about her um, through recommendations and, and um, had read Sasquatch Hunter's Almanac and loved it. And um, she came to Summer Fish Trap and we immediately, you know, just thought, wow, okay, this is who we need. And then the, um, the survey feedback came back and we went, well, we knew she was good, but holy cow. And so we asked her to come back again last year. Um, and again, you know, we've talked a lot about what the virtual decision was, but she jumped in with a big giant yes. And again, people just raved about how wonderful she is. Um, one of the things I've really appreciated is Sharma seems to have a natural ability to build community and something that has shown out and stood out, um, especially during this virtual time we're living in, which is super special. And because of that, we asked her to take on the year long workshop. And again, here comes yes. So for all of you who are taking her workshop, I, I am jealous. Um, I have, I think, um, eavesdropping privilege, so you never know, but I just, again, am so grateful for Sharma and, um, and grateful for her time and her generosity. So um, how are you, Sharma? How's the week been? Um, it's been amazing, sort of uh, reinvigorating for me. I love my cohort. The students are incredible in the novel writing workshop, and I think we're going to have this amazing year I feel like I'm learning how to write a novel now that I'm <laughs> teaching it, uh, which you would hope I would know how by now, but I feel uh, like I'm still learning. So uh, it's just, it's a blast. I'm, and I'm so grateful. I feel like the second fish trap starts, there is just this um, level of positivity that's exuding and people learning from one another. And you mentioned the word community and, um, I, that's what I love about this, is the literary community here. 
Excuse me just for a second. Um, Charles. Go ahead. Charles or Janice, if you could mute. Someone Charles, else. that would be great. Thank you. Someone else is. Oh, sorry about that. A little technical difficulty. <laughs> That's fine. Um, Zoom is always exciting. It is. Everybody's excited. Yeah, it's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> you know, this is this is what it is. This has been the last year. You know, one of the things um, I, I'm sure Mike told you this, we've never sold out a year long workshop before. Um, and this is the first time that that's happened. And I'm curious, you know, especially since it's a novel workshop, do you think there's there's what's your what's your what's your feeling on that? Do you think this year had something to do with it? I mean, why do you think why novels this year? Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I'm reading a story uh, today about two friends and one of them just moved away. And I've noticed a lot of people are making big changes in their lives right now. And I think a lot of it was pandemic inspired. Um, maybe some of that time where we were kind of tucked away by ourselves a little bit more made us restless to try and do other things. And I think, I think we're maybe seeing a little bit of that happening. Um, you know, I should ask some of my students and see um, what they say if the pandemic maybe had something to do with their wanting to try writing a novel. I will say that they came with the writing chops. Um, all of them seem like they've been writing and practicing the craft already for quite some time. And, and that's really, what I've felt the last um, se uh, couple of years that I've been teaching at Fish Trap is that the the people who are here, both the instructors and the people who are in the workshops are just already uh, so dedicated and um, so aware, but yeah. Um, That's good to hear. Yeah, and I, and I know that when that happens to you, it just feeds on each other and every, the, the whole level goes up. That's great. Yeah makes discussion so much fun. Oh, I bet. Yeah, I absolutely. That should be fun. So Sharma, are you ready to tell us a story? Yes. Um, yeah. Well, um, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Um, so I am reading tonight. Um, uh, today, it's not tonight yet. Um, I'm reading a short story uh, that I wrote for the bedtime stories event uh, with Humanities Washington. So I'm kind of uh, I decided to do this because Beth Piatote, who is one of my very favorite writers and humans, uh, read also from her bedtime stories uh, story earlier this week. So uh, I thought it would be fun to do that as well. Um, I love the idea of reading a bedtime story to you in the middle of the day. And I will say, um, I wrote this story for a big live audience. So it will be very weird to read it here where I can't hear any laughter or anything uh, that may uh, leave me feeling even more self-conscious than I already feel when I'm doing a live reading. So that will be kind of funny, a funny experiment. Um, this story is called Good Steak, as in the steak you eat. Um, and is for my friend Ellen and my friend Kate Vita. Uh, I wrote it in the fall of 2019. Um, my friend Kate passed away right at the beginning of COVID um, on April 4th in 2020. And my friend Ellen uh, just moved away. So um, as I'm reading, about to read the story, I'm thinking about the ways um, of the ways that friendships kind of can come and go. And sometimes there is loss and sometimes there is change. Um, and that I still have that love uh, for them here. So this is called Good Steak. It was Carol who set up my blind date with the man in the moon. I'm gonna hook you up with someone if it kills me, Carol texted. And it really might kill me, you know, given how sick I am. Ugh, I wrote back, life is going to super suck without you. I was doing this more for Carol than I was for me. I'd already dated a couple of her other friends by this point, and I was getting a bit jaded. There was the narcoleptic, if gentle, little boy blue, who kept leaving his horn behind wherever we went, always quadrupling our cab fare with all of the backtracking we had to do, and how boring those many cab rides were, his head lolling from side to side, his mouth slightly ajar, snoring through some of my most important soliloquies about mortality and the Anthropocene. It was not the first time I'd put a man to sleep, 
but it was certainly the most frequent. Little Boy Blue was, despite his name, a full-grown male and handsome with a remarkably unlined face, as though he'd encountered very little stress in life, but he dressed like a rabbit in a Beatrix Potter book, blue seersucker rompers, and a messily affixed matching cap. When he listened to me, he did so with his thumb hanging crookedly from his mouth, and this became my cue to speak louder and to crack open a window in the cab, he was heading straight to nappy town. Maybe certain individuals enjoy pampering a partner through that midlife crisis sort of thing, but I found his immaturity a complete turnoff. And after a few sad outings, I stopped texting him back and texted Carol instead, LBB is a dud. I thought he'd be so sweet for you, she wrote back. He reminds me of a cat and I know how much you love cats. It's true, now that I think about it, how cat-like he was, always warm, always napping, always forgetting that goddamn horn everywhere, a horn he carried around with him for some unknown reason because I never heard him play it, not once, not that I wanted to hear it, but hey, it's his thing, not mine. It was probably a lovey for him, brought him comfort when he was falling asleep or whatever, the poor guy. Cat or not, I texted Carol, he's not for me. So she set me up with Peter Peter Pumpkin Eater, but he kept trying to take me home and force me into his pumpkin. And I got a very Jane Eyre vibe from it all, that once I was in that pumpkin, I would never again see the light of day, that I'd be the mad pumpkin wife trapped in those orange stinking wet pumpkin walls with a husband whose moniker sounded like a dirty sex act. No dice, I texted Carol. So she set me up with the cat in the fiddle, which was great at first because I really do love cats and I loved petting her behind her ears and listening to her purr. But this particular cat was, unlike Little Boy Blue, very devoted to her instrument. And I got really sick of listening to her fiddle day in and day out, however skilled she was. Too talented, I texted Carol. How about Simple Simon, she wrote. You've gotta be kidding me. The butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker? Too many knives, I wrote back. Too many sweets, too many first degree burns. She suggested Georgie Porgy. I dated him back in the 90s, I wrote. I was in love with him, but all of those tears. I'm no longer such a masochist. By then, we'd all heard about the dish and spoon running off maniacally together, happy as can be, and none of us were surprised, really, because they were very well suited and, of course, very passionate after all of those years waiting around in dark kitchen cabinets for some action. But I had to admit the whole affair made me feel very lonely, even if I wanted to be bigger than all of that somehow, a woman of my own making an artist in my own right, and a loving, if inconsistent, friend. Don't worry, Carol texted. We'll keep looking. Carol was always the best sort of friend, even when I was an asshat. By this point, I knew I might lose her soon, and I was feeling so low about this prospect, I wasn't quite sure if I should be around her. Maybe my being so pissed and sad would only hurt her further. And if I'm being honest, I was even insulted by her ministrations, that no matter my intellectualization and self-deprecation and misanthropy, she saw how desperately I longed for companionship. It was irritating that she put more care and affection into my love life than I did. I'm fine, I texted her. I'm perfectly fine with dying alone. I've been reading a lot about human composting and I think I'd like that done to my body when I'm gone, if you want to look into that for me instead. Carol texted back cheerfully, oh honey, I'm the only one who gets to make death plans right now. I'm very territorial about this. The hunt, she wrote, continues. Sometimes the thing with friends is they don't know when to leave well enough alone. Although the truth was that I loved Carol for this very reason. Only a few days passed before she wrote me in all caps, I've found him. And then she set up my first date with the man in the moon. My first impression of the man in the moon was that he was full of himself. 
looming down on me from his great height with an aloofness that signals either robust confidence or crippling insecurity. We met at a steak and potatoes restaurant called Meat Killers, where his first words to me were poignantly, I'm a vegan. Try the potatoes, I suggested. I ordered the filet mignon, extra rare. I took his quietness at first as some sort of ploy to get me to open up, and I was pissed at myself that it worked. I overshared that I was newly diagnosed with IBS, that I was a washed up writer, that I'd been sober for eight years, that I hated eggs, even hated the word egg with its weird double G, that I'd made the front page of the paper as a teenager for driving drunk through a cow field and manslaughtering a newborn calf. I could tell he thought it was strange how voraciously I ate my steak through this last story. It's a coping mechanism, I said. He gave a gentle nod of his big round ivory head. It annoyed me how subtly his head glowed. He poked at his potatoes sadly. He'd forgotten to order it without the butter. I washed the steak down with a lukewarm glass of water, horrified at myself for divulging so much so quickly. So what's your story, I asked. Oh, he said slowly, you know, I work nights. I have what you might consider a primo view, but I see some ugly stuff. People, he said, people can be terrible. He pushed away from his plate just slightly, hanging his big head so that he stared glassily into the tablecloth and the craggy gray features of his face settled into a look of such forlornness that I reached my hand across the table and touched him gently on the wrist. The man in the moon gave a little jump and then relaxed. He smiled sadly at me. Thank you, he said, nodding at my hand. Sometimes I think people just want to stomp across me and stab flagpoles into me, like that's all I'm good for. I was a bit shocked since I'd spent many years feeling the same way. I don't want to stab you, I said, and I hate walking. Sometimes I just roll around everywhere. Like I roll out of bed and roll over to the bathroom and roll into the shower and turn the shower spigot on with my toes and just let the spray hit me right in the face. He laughed, same here, and usually I'm sobbing. Me too. It's fun to cry in the shower, he said. We beamed out at one another, the man in the moon and I, and a few minutes later, I excused myself and went to the restroom and texted Carol, you're the best friend ever, you bonkers bitch. He's a misanthrope, he's miserable, he's kind, he's perfect. She wrote back, like you. He's nicer than me, I typed. Nah, you're pretty great for how miserable you are. Maybe one day you'll see it. I refuse, I wrote. I prefer to wallow in the horrors of self-reflection. Anyway, thank you, C. Text you later. But when I went back to the table, the man in the moon had already left. There was a handwritten note, however, had to jet to work, but I'll be on the lookout for you. I wandered out to the parking lot, feeling really smooth and hydrated after all of that lukewarm water. And there he was, scooting across the sky overhead, witness to the multifold ways we humans were busy destroying the world and all of the ways in which we weren't. I waved and he shone. I drove to Carol's house. She answered the door, arms thrown open to me, her wife and child already in their beds. We hugged laughing and then went to sit on her back deck where we gossiped about, gossiped about my first good date in years as if he wasn't up there staring down at us. You won't be able to keep secrets from this one, she told me. Kind of creepy, huh? Carol agreed. Yes, it was creepy. I asked her, are you ready for tomorrow? She grimaced. Oh, don't make me talk about it. You don't have to talk, I said, but it sucks. And sometimes talking about things that suck is really fun. I'm so glad you're here, Carol laughed. It really won't be so bad. The best part is all of those nice nurses poking and prodding me, all of that excitement and attention, and all of that awesome drugged up sleep. Wow, I'm jealous. I'd love to be poked and prodded and on good drugs. Carol smiled. But I can't sleep tonight, she said. I've got all of this energy because I know I'm going to be deadsville the next few weeks. So I cleaned all of the toilets and hung up 12 family portraits in the den. I teased her that no one needs 12 family portraits. One is more than enough. 
Don't you just sit around staring at one another all of the time anyway, marveling at one another's beauty and goodness and all of that? Aren't you already immortalized in one another's minds? I guess it's more for bozos like you who come to visit, she said. Plus, we all know there's no su such thing as immortality. I grunted in agreement. This, in a way, was why we were so close, Carol and I. We believed humanity was doomed, and that was okay, because even with all of the love and joy and beauty of the world, humankind was hell-bent on serving poverty and war and pain to it too. Man's basic instinct for survival had crossed too many times into militarism and dominance, and so Carol and I believed in mortality over survival. We believed in apologies and insecurities and gray areas. We worshiped at the non-altar altar of the anti-dominant. We were proud of ourselves for our entropy. The man in the moon had disappeared behind an inky cloud. He wanted to leave us to the privacy of our conversation. This moon guy is one passive mofo, I noted admiringly. Then I turned to my friend. She sat in the porch light gazing at the dark gathering clouds, still smiling despite it all, entropy or no. Oh boy. <laughs> Tomorrow she would come home beginning to glow just like the moon. Sorry, everybody. Veins filled with powerful drugs that she was told might help her but probably would not. I will be there for her, I told myself ferociously. I wouldn't back away from it in fear the way I wanted to, the fight or flight response that urged me to duck away lest I unravel alongside her. I will be there. Just like she'd kept, just like she'd keep texting me about dating to dispel whatever loneliness she imagined for me. We'd be there until we couldn't be there. You're a good egg, I told Carol. You hate that word, she said. You're a good steak, I told her. Carol leaned back against the chair and closed her eyes. You need to stop eating red meat. Global warming, hun. And when I'm gone, you need to explain the Anthropocene to the kids, she said. Gabriella will be awful at that. She already thinks I tell them too much dark stuff. Consider the darkness covered, buddy, I assured her. We held hands. The man in the moon slunk out from behind the clouds, saw we were finished, gleamed cleanly at us. He was perfect for me, omnipresent but distant too, there and not there at all. Just like it was possible to feel so much sorrow and hope, despair and love all at once. Somewhere beneath the moon's gaze, the dish and the spoon ran swiftly together through the wilderness. Somewhere the owl sang to the pussycat. Somewhere a woman closed a mother goose book and leaned over to kiss her daughter's sleeping face. Sometimes it feels like the horrors of the world are dark and deep and ever expanding. And what a wonder it is that stories and friendship and love are here too. Those bright lights we keep swimming toward, those kind pendants suspended in the dark, signaling, uh, signaling to us from the murk that we can be good, we can be better, we can keep going. And that is the end. Everybody, thank you. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, you, wow, you don't, yeah. Um, um, I have not read that aloud since um, my friend passed, and um, woo, it's hilarious because I remember a friend and I in um, grad school laughing at a professor that started crying at her own work. And being like, we're never going to be that person that cries at our own work at an event. And now I'm <laughs> totally choked up. Um, but yeah, oh my gosh. Whew. Choked it out there. <laughs> I, I, I normally, ha yeah, there's all sorts of reactions for those of you who aren't seeing this. The, the <laughs> comments are coming. Um, so you're getting lots of support for your emotions. I've, I've learned that lesson myself. I broke into not sobs, but definitely teared up at the end of the kids reading today. And it's like, wow, okay. So yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I, I don't even know what to say, Sharma. I am just, I, I want to give you a chance. I, I kept thinking the way you were able to weave in the personal, what, you know, which is 
real. And even your own, you know, I know enough about you, you know, to know that some of the things you alluded to in your own life were in there as well. And then still make it just, I mean, just laugh out loud, funny. What is your secret sauce? How are you, how are you making that work? Uh, well, I will say, um, a couple of things. <laughs> so they gave me the theme about man in the moon. And I, I have to admit, I sort of groaned when I heard that theme. I just wasn't really interested in writing about men's and moons, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but um, so um, I, I really struggled and I struggled with, I, I wrote a few different stories that were um, no good. And when I wrote this story, I felt like it was too silly, um, that the beginning of it was um, too silly, too much. Um, and then, uh, because initially the whole idea of the story was this woman going on a date with the man in the moon and, and him possibly being a big jerk, I think was how I started it. Um, but then it kind of shifted and changed. Um, and I, I, was, I was having a lot of conversations with my friend Kate about mortality at the time. Um, and they were also conversations where we were laughing a lot. So we were just, we were discussing death, but we were also laughing despite of it, because of it, um, because, uh, in some ways, uh, her cancer and chronic illness are just so boring too. I mean, they're, so we were laughing about some of the boring items of that and that, uh, you know, they're, there, I mean, we were just, there were so many contrasts to that. And I also think about those contrasts when I'm writing humor, because I think what makes people laugh is that sense of surprise. Um, uh, or like when you're taking a trope like little boy blue um, and you're saying he dresses like a rabbit from a Beatrix Potter book, it's, you know, it's like an image taken from the reality of little boy blue, but it becomes funny when you think of him in a taxi cab with you on a date as a grown man. Um, so it's, it's sort of like bringing in some of those details and then contrasting them with a very different situation, a different sort of reality. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this too, these contrasts in the myth and magic um, workshop I'm doing tomorrow too. But, um, but I love things that surprise me. It's one reason I love um, humor in fiction, um, or emotion in general. I, I love uh, I, I love expressing emotion in that way because sometimes I intellectualize motion, emotion um, and I don't feel it. Um, and then it really creeps up on me like I did just now. Like it did just now because I'm, I'm having all these memories occurring as I'm reading of my friend when I was writing this and we knew that she was going to die, but we didn't know when. And then I'm remembering my very last conversation with her and all of that's coming in too. And so it amazes me um, how sometimes emotion feels so separate from the brain or something for me. But anyway, I'm rambling, but um, yeah, contrast. I, I think humor is about that sense of surprise, that twist and turn and the contrast there. There's uh, Alexander wrote a question about writing nursery rhyme jokes and you said the timing of each is impeccable what's your secret I was curious about that too because I know that a lot of you know a lot of comedies and I'm going to use my my musician brain you know there's a rhythm and a timing to all of that there really is how are you um able to do that um is that something you think about when you're writing something humorous um the timing of the timing and the writing of it or the reading aloud yeah, the rhythm, I think well both actually I mean yeah. there, you know that's that's another another question I have for you is the reading aloud part but yeah um, uh well with the writing of it again it's that I think it's um boy you know I should it uh I should do some research on this because I'm not quite sure where <laughs> where the timing might come from um uh, except, you know, I do, I do love humor. I, I love humorous shows. Um, you know, I love like Bojack Horseman and things like that. Um, and, um, maybe I am listening to the rhythm of those jokes and then trying to emulate some of those things. And, um, yeah, uh, as regards to reading aloud, I, I don't think I'm the best reader in the world. I, I had a, I had a, an actress a couple of different times, some actresses, uh, and once an actor have read my work aloud and I was so impressed at how many more laughs they could get 
in their reading because I think they do, they are trained on, on that timing and allowing pause. Um, and I think that that's kind of an important thing to remember both as we're writing on the page and as we're reading aloud too. Um, and I was kind of nervous reading and I'm a little sweaty because I think I, I wasn't sure if, if any of the humor was landing because you can't, I'm on Zoom, it's so weird. You can't hear any anything, but um, yeah. I feel, I feel your pain with that for sure. You know, and especially if you're, you know, limited to one screen and what you're reading is on the same screen and then you can't even see faces. Yeah, it's tricky. Yeah. It's a, it, you're missing that energy for sure. Yeah. 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 I don't feel painful about it, just amused and That's also yeah. sweaty. A little scary. Amused yeah. and sweaty. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> a little fearful. Um, yeah. Marta asked about your title is taken from the story. I noticed the same pattern in the Cassandra. Do you write with a title first? Well, these are also myths and things, or do you take it from the story? I know this one was, you know, kind of proscribed, but how are you? Um, yeah. Well, the title is Good Steak for this one. And that was taken after that line of dialogue with yeah. her friend, her friend, because she mentions earlier in the story about the good egg or, or I'm sorry, that she doesn't like eggs and she doesn't even like the word egg with I its weird that. double G. Yeah. Uh, that is not autobiographical. I like eggs. I have no problem with the word egg, but that was true to the character. And I think part of humor in writing is calling back to those moments. So it becomes funny when her friend knows her so well that she knows that detail that we've also learned as readers. And then um, her friend is... Uh, like, yeah, you don't like that word. And so she says, well, then you're a good steak, even though her friend is like, doesn't want her to eat steak anymore, basically. But um, so, and I, I like really weird titles to things. So I was like, good steak. This seems like a weird title. It sounds good. Um, with the Cassandra, some, it, it depended. Sometimes it would come from um, the writing itself. Sometimes I had an idea from the research um, as I was writing that I wanted to use uh, one of the terms, like I, I think one of the chapters is called a reign of ruin. And that's what our president had said he was going to, um, he was gonna do to Japan. He was gonna um, have them experience a reign of ruin. And, and so that became one of the chapter titles. Um, and now in this new novel I'm writing, there are no chapter titles uh, because it, the rhythm of the story doesn't, it feels like it, needs to be numerical instead for some reason to me or that's um but yeah but I do love I do love titling things that's always a, kind of a joy for me. Kristen wanted to know if you find yourself using humor in writing very often in one way or another. Yeah um so one of my first short stories I had published was uh and I'll talk about this a little bit tomorrow too was called um the McGoogle account, and it was published in the Iowa Review and won a uh, annual humor award that they have. And it was about a cyclops working at a PR firm in Seattle. Um, and so I, and my short story collection has a lot of that humor in it. Sasquatch Hunter's Almanac does. I tried to have humor in the Cassandra, even though I know that is a very, very, very um, dark book too. But, um, but Margaret Atwood tweeted that she thought it was funny. Um, so she, she thought there was humor in it. I don't know. Um, but I think most people that read it are like, why did you write something so, so dark? <laughs> but, um, but I try, I try to put humor in everything. Cause I, I like humor. I like the, again, it's, I like the contrast it adds on the page, um, contrast of emotion. So is there a, uh, a, can you, can you tease us? Is there a, a, a myth or a fairy tale? link to your new novel? Uh, no, but it is, it is rooted very much, I think, in a kind of a tradition of absurdism. So I'm intending for it to be funny and weird. Um, it's about a, uh, it's kind of loosely based on uh, Nabokov's invitation to a beheading about a woman who gets um, uh, put in jail in a plexiglass cell in a corporate tower and they tell her they're gonna put her to death. Um, but she kind of exists in this plexiglass cell but all around her it's, um, you know, people making sales and doing, uh, you know, uh, very uh, high-end retail sort of work and that sort of stuff. Um, so I, uh, or corporate work I should say, but 
uh, it's a weird one and hopefully we'll read pretty funny, but I, I do feel like it's, uh, I'm surprised at how sad it is. And I think that's because I've been so sad this whole last year. Um, and I mean, maybe last two years probably. Um, and I, I swing in and out of depression quite a lot. Um, and, um, so I don't know. So it's also supposed to be funny, but it's also really sad. <laughs> so, like a lot of my stuff. I was gonna say, like life right now. So I, <laughs> yeah. I did want to read everybody. Lainey wrote, um, Lady Zumas wrote a great comment. She said, your story reminds me of something Grace Paley said, that a good story must be about more than one thing. And I think that's exactly right. And then Beth Piatone also wrote it so captures the depth of friendship and love between these two women. Their banter and jokes are perfect. Great edge and true feeling. So I just want the rest of the world to see that and, and hear those yeah. comments. Yeah, I, I love that Grace Paley quote. And it's funny because the I was I was so bored kind of while I was writing the woman wants to date someone narrative because I feel like I really did kind of grind into that narrative hard in my 20s. And now in my mid 40s, I'm not as interested in it, but it ended up being really fun to write. But at its heart, despite how the story begins, and there are hints immediately about uh, her friend's illness, of course, they come right in the first line, but they're they're quick and they, they're easy to miss, I think maybe. Um, but I really wanted it to be about this friendship. And, and um, I really was thinking of these two friends in particular when I wrote it. Um, one of them, my friend Ellen, who just moved away as the godparent to my children. Um, and, um, and my friend Kate, who uh, I think I'm gonna be unpacking these very profound conversations I had with her for the rest of my life. I mean, her major question was, how do I leave a life that I love? How, do, how does anybody leave a life that we love um, and people that we love? How do we do that? Um, but yeah. Well, someone who um, has been dating more recently than in my 20s, I will say you captured the, um, the boredom and despair of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, there were a couple moments I went, oh, she was in the car with me that night. So I appreciate that. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. That's true. And it yeah. does just continue. Yes, it, it doesn't get better, but there it is. That's why I have two dogs now and two cats. So we're all good. <laughs> anyway. Well, I want to uh, thank you, Sharma, and thank everybody. Um, everybody. And these were some great comments, great conversations. Um, please, Sharma, make sure you get a chance to read some of the the kudos that will make your, your heart happy, just like your reading does for us. Um, next up at five o'clock, for those of us in summer fish trap land, we are hosting, uh, Mike is hosting the first of two open mics um, right at five. So go back into the summer fish trap site and you'll find a link to the Zoom. Um, and if you've been working on something you wanna share, uh, jump in, there are rules. Um, so follow the rules and have a good time. So that'll be fun. And then tomorrow is the last day of your workshops, which is crazy that that happened so fast. Um, and then for those, uh, for everybody, the fish trap fellows reading is tomorrow at, uh, one o'clock, which I would encourage everybody to check out the, some, the summer fish trap fellows are always remarkable every year. And, as we've heard this week, there are a few of them who are teaching currently. So you want to get in on these folks tomorrow at one o'clock. And then at two, Sharma's back to do craft talk, which she talked about a little bit. And that's, I'm excited about that. Um, and then three o'clock um, up at Wallawa Lake Lodge uh, is Nina's McConaughey's year long workshop is wrapping up and they're gonna be doing a reading at the lodge. We are going to do our level headed best to make that recording available to you. So um, it should be up by the end of the day tomorrow if you're not in the county and can't make it. Um, however, I will say things happen. So we will do our best. <laughs> and, and then of course, we're wrapping everything up. Um, uh, tomorrow night or tomorrow evening, four o'clock. I guess that's not evening. It is if you live where Frank lives. Tomorrow evening with the keynote with Frank X Walker. Um, there are tickets still available for those of you who are watching this online. Um, and of course, all of the rest of you tune in. And that one again will also be available. So if you decide you need a Zoom break, you will be able to watch it later as well. So I want to thank you all. Um, 
and we will see you. Wow. We will see you tomorrow or some of you, we will see in just a few minutes. Thanks a lot. Anna, and thank you for all your hard work.